Hello and welcome to the ID Talks, the last episode of this season. We're very happy for those of you who managed to join us in Zoom and also sending big greetings to everybody following us on Facebook live stream. My name is Anna. I am the facilitator of ID Talks. This uh, uh, series of independently organized webinars are brought to you by Salto Inclusion and Diversity Resource Center. And this fall, we have been focusing on ID Talks under the motto, let's talk about anti-racism. I feel extremely happy and privileged to present you today's topic and today's speaker. Uh, ID Talks uh, practicing anti-racism today to find out whether there are any EU programs providing opportunities and formats for anti-racism youth work. Um, we have our guest speaker with us joining from Iceland, Mari Miriam Petra, Omar Zdatir Awad. She is working uh, at the Icelandic National Agency as the Eurodesk Officer and NA's Inclusion and Diversity Officer, but also in her private time, she is working as an educator in anti racism field uh, with young people and with youth workers. And she also focused on global studies um, in her master's degree studies um, with a focus on anthropology. Her experiences are also very much taken from her own experience of a person that has been uh, with a background, uh, with a mixed background. So um, yeah, without further ado, I would like to pass Miriam now the floor. Hi, hi. Thank you for the introduction. And I'll just start by sharing my screen so I can get started. And uh, then we can just start by a short uh, about me. See, who am I? Uh, like uh, it's just said, uh, I am from Iceland. I am also uh, Egyptian. Uh, so my mom uh, is Icelandic and my father was originally from Egypt. So I grew up most of my life in Iceland, spending my time in the capital Reykjavik uh, and in the Icelandic Westfjords where my mom is from and that uh, photo is taken. And uh, I have a huge family in Cairo, Egypt, but I haven't spent much time there. I visit it uh, as regularly as possible, but uh, because of something I haven't been there in years until now this October, I, I managed to spend with my, my family. My first language is Icelandic. I unfortunately do not speak uh, Arabic very well. Uh, I like to think of myself as a poet and a writer. That's kind of my hobby uh, is to write short stories and, and other things. Uh, I used to be a handball player uh, until I was 18. I stopped before I became too professional. And uh, most importantly, I am an anti-racism activist and the inclusion officer of the National Agency for Erasmus Plus in Iceland. Now you know a little bit about me and uh, perhaps we'll understand a bit more about why I am here talking, talking to you on this topic. So what has uh, influenced me and uh, the experiences that uh, I have had in my life uh, have been, uh, I guess, this continued uh, denial of my self-identity as an Icelandic person because uh, the attitudes of people facing me when I was younger and still today that uh, I am never seen as Icelandic. I'm very much treated as uh, I cannot possibly be Icelandic. And even if people hear me speak, sometimes they, they hear me speak with an accent, even though I don't even speak with an accent. And I, I guess this is in a way uh, perceive, uh, the perceiving of the way an Icelandic person should look and what their name should be. I have also experienced when I was younger exclusion based on the fact that I was a foreigner uh, and uh, it, of course, it hurt a lot. And even though I'm smiling right now, it's mainly because I'm just happy to be here and being able to speak with you. Of course, this is a, a subject that is very serious to me. 
Uh, I have also experienced harassment um, due to uh, my background, um, very uh, nasty words that people have, have used in my regard uh, because of my Middle Eastern heritage. So all of these things, as you might imagine, uh, influence a person. And um, when uh, these ideas that are inflicted upon you are also reinforced by negative stereotypes in the media uh, and in public discourse, and not only from comment sections, like uh, is quite common for, uh, you can see on social media and a lot of news outlets have added these comment sections, at least here in Iceland, where people can comment on news articles and they often don't filter themselves uh, at all. And mainly those who are uh, posting something there are the ones with the negative views. Um, but once you are, experiencing prejudice already and then you see these ideas continuously being put forward it has effects on you and then once uh, of course it enters the public discourse and even into the politics and you see these negative uh, then a negative rhetoric being repeated by people in power uh, it deeply affects your self uh, identity and your psyche and the way you're feeling um, within your own country, um, which in my case here in Iceland. So this was the case for me when I was younger, um, trying to fit in and feel like I would belong when uh, all of the signs from, or not all, but most many of the signs I was getting from the outside society was that I, I didn't fit in. And this creates a bit of a tension for a young person. And this is why I think inclusion in youth work is very important and I'll get back to that later. But there was also a lack of role models when I was younger. Uh, the diversity of Iceland wasn't uh, visible. Uh, today, uh, I think uh, almost 25% of the Icelandic population either has an immigrant background, uh, has one foreign born parent or is an Icelandic person born abroad but moved back to Iceland when they were younger and often do not speak Icelandic perfectly. So it's a huge number of the population, but we do not see that represented in media uh, and films uh, as, or even in positions of power. So this has changed, it's changing uh, bit by bit. Uh, however, uh, I think we only this year have our first person of color uh, who is uh, uh, speaking on or, or has the uh, main role in one of the news uh, agencies like prime time television shows. And that's, that's this year. And uh, this was even worse, of course, when I was younger, but the lack of role models uh, made me uh, not able to kind of dream of what I could be. Uh, I remember the moment where I saw the first time, for the first time a brown skinned woman speaking Icelandic on TV and she had a cooking show on, on television. And I remember thinking, oh wow, uh, maybe I could actually be on TV one day because I had never thought I could do any of, thing, of, of such things in Iceland. And I was very lucky in that sense that um, I had female role models that uh, paved the way for me to think that I could do things uh, because I'm a, even though I'm a even though I'm a woman, so to speak. Um, but uh, picturing myself, for example, studying art, uh, I didn't even consider it a possibility, even though I would have liked to, because I never saw any artists that were uh, with a mixed background or with a foreign-sounding name, and I just thought it wasn't uh, wasn't viable for me. So the lack of role models, of course, affects young people as well. And I think it's very important that we keep that uh, in mind uh, in our youth work. And uh, this created this part where I kind of distanced myself from a part of me. And it wasn't until I became a lot older that I started getting closer to my Egyptian heritage. And of course, I lost valuable years in that. Uh, my father passed away when I was 25. And now I'm 32 years old and there's so much I would have wanted to learn from him uh, before that. 
but I wasn't uh, ready for it because I had so much focus when I was younger on just being Icelandic. I didn't want to get in touch with those roots and, and it really uh, affected me in a negative way. Uh, but when I started studying and I, I studied anthropology and I started studying the effects of uh, colonization, for, uh, that was one of my main focuses in the beginning, studying the effects of colonizations uh, of uh, our European powers over other uh, populations. And I, be, I started becoming interested about my own experience and being othered and being uh, cast aside, you know, in the society where I felt like I belonged and and was my home and is my, of course, is my first, my only place of, of living full time. So I started studying uh, these experiences from a more an anthropological point of view and uh, historically what it meant, for example, in, in an Icelandic context and what it meant in uh, in in societies, like sociologically, but also culturally, what uh, how it is affecting us still today. And uh, this one question keep kept coming back: um, it, Does Icelandic necessarily mean white? And I think for a lot of people, even though most Icelandic people, when they define their national identity or what it means to be Icelandic, it's usually in very vague terms. Nobody mentions race at all. Uh, it's in something like speaking about the weather, going, getting an ice cream, even though it's in the middle of the night in a blizzard. Like, it, these kind of intangible elements you cannot touch uh, that we all agree on, singing uh, with a guitar in a family gathering very Icelandic things to do. But however, un unconsciously, there seems to be this connotation on if you don't look a certain type of way, you don't, uh, you, you're not accepted or not perceived as being Icelandic. So the first notion that people have in their minds when they see you is that you cannot possibly be from here. And this is something that came up throughout my life so often, um, especially with the question of where are you from, which I got so often as the first point of contact, people wouldn't even do the small talk they did to the person next to me, they would just jump into where are you from. And then when I just say I'm from Iceland, because that is my personal truth, uh, they would just go into, but no, but where are you really from? And I am really personally me, Miriam, I'm personally just from Iceland. Uh, of course, I have family history and, and I'm proud to talk about my family heritage. Uh, my father is from Egypt, but I've never lived there. And it's very hard for me to say that I am from there uh, when I don't have that experience. I am Egyptian too, but uh, first and foremost, I have always been Icelandic. So I started researching this and I did a research uh, on, uh, I interview research on the subject and I interviewed some Icelandic women that also have a Middle Eastern background. And what I found out was that those who were more white passing, they got less overt prejudice until people find about their ties to the Middle East. So usually there was this sense of uh, the browner or the darker skinned you were, you would experience more overt kind of racism. Um, and then of course you added in the layer of possible Islamophobia because of the Middle Eastern background. Um, but those who were white passing, they usually kind of got away with being accepted as Icelandic until people perhaps saw their names or they started talking about their heritage. And then they would add, get those experiences of, of the prejudice that was built in uh, in this Islamophobic uh, or these negative notions that people have about the Middle East. And one of the questions that came up during my research was when have you become Icelandic enough? And that is what I named my uh, thesis because uh, it felt like these women had gone through so much to prove that they were Icelandic, but people were still treating them like they didn't belong. So there's the sense of belonging that uh, is very necessary for people to feel uh, safe and uh, good in their societies and be active participants. And this is what in, influenced me into looking at uh, inclusion and anti-racism activism. 
So uh, in spring 2021, I started doing lectures on anti-racism. And uh, in the beginning, we were only, uh, I, was I was joined with the, the young black woman who is now on TV, the one I mentioned earlier um, in the primetime news uh, uh, show in Iceland. Um, good friend, Sjanil Sturtledottir. Um, we started doing these lectures. And in the beginning, we were mainly talking to young people at schools and youth centers. But what we found out is that if you're only speaking to young people, often you're not reaching the root of the problem because a lot of the times, even though many times, yes, young people get these ideas from social media, but a lot of the times they are fostered at home or they are overlooked by the adults that are overseeing them, for example, at school and even enforced by the, uh, the teachers. Uh, so uh, we kept hearing the teachers saying, or the youth workers saying, oh, we can't trust the younger generation, they're so open-minded. But I feel like we've been hearing that since I was young and we still have problems with racism coming up uh, over and over again. So in my opinion, uh, anti-racism has uh, more to do with the entire society than only youth in youth work, even though it's of course very important to do it effectively there because we can influence how people uh, go into society and um, how they uh, how their lives are affected or not by it. So before uh, we go further, I want us to be on the same page with these definitions uh, of racism and uh, cultural prejudice that I was talking about earlier. And I think it's very important that we start there so that we are all on the same page. And I'll just start with racism and uh, I'm sure that you have been following uh, the other uh, previous speakers uh, uh, that have been before me and during this uh, during this past uh, couple of weeks um, and uh, but even if you if you have I think it's always good to have this uh, refreshed in your in our minds so one of the I usually start talking about when we, I start talking about racism I mentioned this a nice quote from Tan Tanehisi Coates, uh, who is the author of Black Panther, uh, for those of you who know Black Panther, the Marvel stories. Um, race is the child of racism, not the father. And when you start thinking about it, it's very interesting because a lot of the times we feel that um, uh, racism became a thing because we had races and some of the races uh, started having prejudice against each other, but it's not the case. Uh, racism created the races that we have today. So the racial definitions between, you know, defining people according to races, it originally stems out of the, the need for uh, a hierarchy in order to uh, have um, po power over other populations. So this is put forward as a scientific uh, thing in the 18th century. We of course know today that there's nothing scientific about these definitions, but they're put down um, as a scientific explanation of the differences of human beings. Um, and additional to physical traits, uh, there are moral traits put forward as facts uh, relating to each race and uh, the way of behaving and the temperament is all put down as a scientific fact in a book uh, uh, where all life on earth is classified in, uh, in different species. And uh, even though, like uh, I said, we know that this has no, absolutely no truth to it because it's pseudoscience, and based on uh, temperaments and, and opinions of people during that time of the racial hierarchy that they perceived the world by. Um, and they used this defini these definitions to justify colonialism and horrible treatment of people. So even though we know today that the, this, has, this classification is not true, it still has sociological effects. So, uh, the solution is not to stop talking about racism, which I often feel is the case. People think that if we don't speak about it, the problem will just go away. 
But racial, race and racial experiences start becoming part of people's identities because it means a lot to them. And uh, it defines who they are and it defines their lives. So by denying someone to speak about race and speak mm -hmm. about racism and how they are feeling uh, towards their own race can be like denying them a part of their identity as well as denying them a space to talk about their experiences that other people might not uh, understand. And usually this affects, like not talking about racism has more negative effects on those who are subject to racism than who, those who are never subject to racism. So racism uh, in its core is also the modern type of racism is treating people differently based on the color of their skin, uh, just to put it in a very simple term, being differently in a negative way. And then we have something called cultural prejudice, which is also sometimes defined as neo-racism. Basically after the Second World War and the civil rights movements uh, during the 20th century, I, humans or we as a global society kind of realized that racism was probably a bad thing uh, and uh, could have bad consequences, obviously. So instead of using race as a way to discriminate or judge people um, and this is of course uh, subconsciously not uh, on uh, people are not doing these things on purpose often but cultural elements like language religion a way of dressing ethnicity are used as a base of prejudice and sometimes these are very connected to uh, racism because you can see it that uh, certain negative elements connected to certain cultures are uh, connected to a certain way of looking but cultural prejudice can also just be uh, in the way of uh, putting forward statements about people based off of their perceived cultural identity and uh, that might not have anything to do with their race, so to speak, but it could be saying everybody that belongs to this group uh, is so and so, and therefore we, you know, we cannot have them in our society or something. The cultural prejudice of, is often reinforced by our medias, um, uh, the news that we get and the movies that we watch. And, uh, and I think it's very important to, to know these different uh, ways of, you know, different forms of prejudice as, uh, we, we might have many different forms of prejudice, but racism is more uh, deep rooted in our societies and, and has effects on our entire societal structure still today. And cultural racism comes kind of in continuation of it and uh, varies different uh, between countries, of course, uh, and is still affecting people uh, as well. And uh, often, like I said, is uh, deeply connected to racism, but people just don't want to use the term racism or say that they are racist, that they, they just put forward cultural elements uh, as an excuse to, to have uh, exclusive, uh, excluding um, opinions uh, on others. Um, when we speak about race, it's also, of course, important to speak about whiteness and white privilege because race has kind of become a definition only for non-white people, uh, where whiteness in our societies, of course, reminding you that I am speaking also from an Icelandic perspective where the majority of people are, are white. Uh, but if we look at race as a rainbow or a color scale, of course, white must be on there. So uh, we should all be looking at this as an issue of all of us, not just of the people who are uh, with other uh, colors other than white. Um, and uh, when we speak about white privilege, it is important to know that people can have, um, you know, they can lack many things in their lives and nobody is saying that if you have white privilege, your life is automatically good. It just only means that you do not automatically uh, have to live with negative consequences of your race. So you are exempt from that. Uh, when that never affects you, then you are living with uh, white privilege. You can have some other things in your life that are uh, making you less privileged in other aspects, but it is not because of your race. For example, I am can be quite white passing, and I I, I acknowledge the fact 
that I um, have certain privileges over people who have darker skin. I also have a privilege in the way that uh, I am able to walk up and down stairs very easily. And uh, that is a privilege that I have. And if I don't face it, I can ac accidentally be excluding to other people because I am unaware of the realities that they face, just an ex as an example. And I think intersectionality is also very important to realize that there are different facts about each individual that cause, can cause a different set of privileges or a different set of discrimination. So depending on if you're a black queer person, you might have a different set of discriminations facing you than if you are a, a black male person or a black female person, as well as you are if you are a white person who is uh, queer or disabled, you have different sets of um, discrimination facing you or different sets of privileges. And uh, I think this is something that for me uh, comes out of uh, context uh, here in Iceland, where we talk a lot about uh, gender equality, but very often the gender equality forums are filled with uh, white Icelandic able-bodied women, and there is seems to be still a lack of space or representation of a queer uh, person of color or disabled uh, women in the gender equality spectrum. So for me, intersectionality is very important because we need to also take into account the different ways that our the facts that are related to our lives affect it differently for different people in different locations. So uh, now back to the basics. Uh, I am also uh, the inclusion and diversity officer at the National Agency for Erasmus Plus uh, here in Iceland. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, the inclusion strategy work that we have uh, been doing, um, but I would like to in encourage you uh, and to take up the conversation in your organization to see if you have an inclusion strategy available um, because inclusion strategy uh, can be a good tool to have some sort of roadmap uh, to achieve more inclusive uh, youth work um, and I think, of course, anti-racism should be an obvious part of any inclusion strategy uh, depending on uh, the context of the country where you are in. And uh, so I'm, I'll encourage you to just go on, on Salto and, and uh, the website has a lot of uh, tools and uh, there's a roadmap and there are good practices. So I'll, I'll not linger too much on that. Uh, I just want to briefly go over um, why inclusion is important in youth work. Um, youth work is uh, about opportunities and I think we can all agree on that that uh, working with young people is giving the giving them an opportunity to grow and uh, see something positive for their future that is why we work with young people to to give them uh, especially like out of school activities that are um, you know to encourage them to, to grow as individuals and see where they want to head in life. So if we are not careful and uh, our youth work becomes non-inclusive uh, and some young people get left behind, we are maintaining or can be inadvertently maintaining societal problems um, that stem from exclusion uh, that can be caused, for example, by uh, racism. And uh, I think it's also important to note that uh, for human beings uh, experiencing exclusion uh, or for example, experiencing racism has both psychological and physiological effects. And uh, the psychological ones, of course, is the anxiety of, of feeling kind of attacked from all sorts of um, spaces that are possibly are or should be a safe spaces where you know you want to go and and feel good but you might like you know you're supposed to be able to go and go to school and live a harass free life but we know that even in schools that you might be subject to racism um, and I think it's very important that we uh, notice that, or note that uh, these feelings can uh, and these feelings of anxiety uh, can make people either become more introverted and less uh, 
productive or less uh, willing to participate, but they can also make people kind of aggressive to their societies. And uh, we want to try to break that barrier and, and reach people uh, with our youth work um, because it is one of the ways that we can uh, build up the, the self uh, identities or self um, value of young people. Um, there's also a factor that we need to take into account that is the physical effects of racism, um, because racism uh, can cause uh, you know, physical issues like uh, bodily pain that comes from basically the anxiety of being subject to racism all the time. And uh, being subject to racism uh, once in a while from your peers at the same <clears throat> time as the public discourse uh, might continually be negative towards the group that you belong to is like a, another layer added on top of it. So often for us as youth workers, we might only see uh, young people interacting with each other and once in a while they say some things, but we have to take into account that the, the things that are being said are maybe then reinforced by things that the young people can read about themselves or about the group they belong to. And then they might hear politicians speak about how we don't need people like them in the country. So it adds on to it. And, and these, this can foster such feelings of exclusion that uh, we have inactive citizens or even worse people who uh, get led into uh, destructive behaviors. So we might need to adjust uh, the, inf the way we advertise our youth programs um, because, and the events that we're having, because information doesn't always reach in the way we might assume. So different experiences can affect whether people think that the opportunities being advertised are for them. If they have continuously been told that they don't belong in a certain space, it's very hard for a young person to look at a set of information and think, yes, this is for me, uh, if they have an experience of being told by their peers that they're, they don't belong or they get the messages from the wider society that they don't. So we might have to take into account that when we are making ads, we might have to do different kinds of ads for different target groups, for example. And uh, I've had this conversation with uh, uh, the international officers uh, at the University of Iceland once, uh, where I don't think they realized that the young people with an immigrant background in Iceland, uh, we are of course looking at it from an Icelandic context, um, they, the officers, they thought that they would definitely be students that would be willing and ready to go on exchanges, but they were surprised that they weren't signing up for it or applying to be exchange students. And then I, I reminded them that they might, they're, they're, even though their parents have moved from abroad, it might not be obvious to them that studying abroad from the country they've moved to would be a viable option with the Erasmus program that they don't might not they might come from countries outside the EU that uh, don't know that their Erasmus exists and that there is a support uh, a mechanism in place so the information needs to reach people differently and uh, otherwise we if we keep posting it in the same way we might be continuously surprised as to why uh, certain groups do not uh, apply to participate in our programs or projects. Um, and then the visibility is of course very important. Um, and uh, if there is a, a diverse group of participants in the project, are we highlighting them, but are we also letting them take active part or are they just there for show? This is some questions that I think is very important for youth workers to take into account. Um, also for uh, the young people to have someone to look up to, uh, that is also very important. Uh, so if you have a diverse group of staff, that of course can be very helpful for a diverse group of young people, so they have someone to relate to. And uh, raising awareness of the topic is very important, and I'm very happy that there are people here today uh, willing to watch this. Uh, and of course that means that they are interested in their topic, but I hope that uh, they also can bring this awareness to their work because I'm guessing, and this has been the reality for me, that there is a different level of interest between colleagues. Um, and 
sometimes it takes a bit of an effort to talk about these things with other project leaders who are probably, and most of the time, great project leaders in what they're doing, but they might never have had to think about topics such as racism. So they inadvertently might be uh, out, in aware of the realities of participants and what might come up in a, in a group of uh, people with variously different backgrounds. So it's us, uh, our job to create a sp safe space and uh, not stay silent if we see exclusion happening. And I'm not saying, and this is what I tell the young people and the youth workers I, I talk to normally, I'm not telling you that you have to uh, pick a fight or go into a deep heated argument every time that you don't agree with something. I mean, I, I can get very heated over this topic, but sometimes it's just enough that there's a person that says, I don't agree with the way you're speaking about this right now, or I don't agree with the way you're speaking or excluding or whatever. It doesn't have to be more than that. Just saying, I don't agree with this way, but we can have a talk about it later, uh, might be enough to influence other people around to think, yeah, okay, it wasn't the right to, to say that, or it wasn't the right to do that. Uh, but if we don't do anything and if we stay silent, uh, that is how the prejudice keeps uh, growing because they only get fostered by the negative voices. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Erasmus Plus and the European Solid Solidarity Corps projects are a good way to open young people to horizons. And I'm sure many of you uh, already know this. Um, there, it could be good to go uh, on youth exchanges with young people and possibly aiming specifically at going with the group that might need it the most, uh, might need a change of scenery, or just to get a group that has been kind of segregated along certain lines to travel together and maybe form some bonds that would, wouldn't form in a typically normal setting after school activities or something but it's not always the case that it's possible to bring the young people out so why not use the erasmus program to get grants to for staff mobility to go and see best practices elsewhere or do job shadowing uh, where you can learn from um, other organizations or other youth workers uh, or even get someone to come and work with you that might have a an influence on, on the way that you're running at your th the things at your youth organization. And volunteering, of course, uh, is also a good way to, to get, I, I don't know how your organizations are put up, but the, the ones that have the possibility to bring in volunteers from abroad might be able to bring in volunteers uh, with the knowledge uh, of the background of the young people that you're working with and to help uh, help or foster a certain understanding and for them to have visible role models that they can look up to, which could be, could be good. Um, and I always want to point out how important it is to avoid tokenism. Tokenism is when one person of color, for example, is put on the front of the brochure about what you've been doing and then there's nothing uh, there's no part active participation of people of color in taking any decisions or anything within the entire thing that is being put forward. And um, if you're applying for inclusion grants, and I'm basing this off of experience, having read over applications, um, please uh, make sure that you're actually including the students that are are the diverse group that you are applying for the inclusion grant for. Include them in the dialogue of, of what is necessary for them to participate. Include them in the organization of the event or, or, or make sure that at least you are bringing them on the youth exchange that, um, that you're organizing. Uh, the example I have in mind that I, I remember seeing is an application that repeatedly stated how much how high percentage of their young people were with a foreign background, but the whole project was based off their reading skills or finishing to read some book and then they would all go to another country and meet young students that had finished reading a similar book. Uh, but the, in this case, the book was in Icelandic 
and there was no mentioning of how they were going to pick students from this group, uh, the 20% that were uh, with an immigrant background, um, who might, uh, and in many cases in, these, uh, in this school, uh, could have been struggling with Icelandic. There was no mentioning how they were going to make sure that the group that was ultimately going to get selected uh, would be a diverse group. So I don't care if your school has 20% students with immigrant background, if you're going to apply for a project and you're saying it's inclusive, you have to include uh, some students from that background. Otherwise don't mention it at all or don't apply for an inclusive project. Anyway, so um, I'm gonna see what's going on in the chat now. Um, not super much going on in okay. chat. I think mostly it's me just sharing my wow moments <laughs> okay. in, the, in the meantime. But what's going on in the room is amazing because we experienced this small technical problem in the morning with our mailing lists. And now it seems that over 20 people have joined us, which okay. is great and will allow us to do some practical workshop like uh, elements that we were initially planning. Okay, so should we do the Mentimeter exercise? Yes, or do you please. want to do okay then i will swap over to so before i go into my kind of pointers for practicing anti-racism um which is the final part of this presentation i'm going to ask you participants dear participants to take out your phones and we'll do a little mentimeter exercise together uh which is uh, this self-reflection exercise that i do as an uh, inclusion officer uh, here in Iceland. Okay, who are you is the first question. Um, before you, you're not supposed to answer anything on the screen right now, uh, either note it down on your phone in notes or something, or on a piece of paper, write down some aspects about you, who you are. Uh, it's just personal for you. You don't have to share it with anyone. But for example, myself, I'm a woman, I'm Icelandic, I'm Egyptian. Um, I have, I live a child-free life by choice. I have two dogs. This is information about me that I'm sharing with you willingly, but you don't have to share anything. I'm just saying, find some definitions of who you are and put it down on a piece of paper or on your phone, somewhere where you can look at it later. And uh, once you've done that, uh, just put it aside and we'll go through these questions and then we'll come back to these elements and uh, take a little quick look at them. Okay. But our first question, yes, okay. So I see you are answering it already, that's perfect. Um, if you can now answer this, those that haven't. Um, so it's always a good question to start with. Do you know what alt text is? So for those of you who don't know, and this is not an exam, there are no trick questions here. Uh, we'll not get upset with any of your answers. It's all, all for self-reflecting. So alt text, for those of you who do not know, is text that you can enter in many website formats and in a lot of uh, programs or applications uh, to describe what is on an image. So that people who have vis visual impairments and use screen readers uh, to describe, to, to read out what is on a page can actually know what is on an image. So for example, if you put an image with a text on it, but you don't put an alt text, a screen reader will not be able to grab what is said on the image. Or also if you just put, create a nice brochure and there's a, or a PDF brochure or a website uh, where there's an image that makes the text lighter, um, a person who doesn't see uh, will not be able to get the information from, uh, from the screen reader unless somebody has written in the alt text a description of the image. And this is often something we uh, have to do ourselves. And uh, often we see this alt text box, um, for example, on WordPress, it's there when you upload an image, you can automatically, you can write in the alt text. But before I started working as an inclusion officer, I had no idea what was being asked for. So I never put anything. But now I know that it's very important that if I'm uploading uh, an image onto the website that I used, for example, for Eurodesk Iceland, uh, I have to put in the alt text or 
uh, people might not be able to see it. My purpose with this question is that if you were, if you had visual impairments, you would not have a choice. You would most likely know what alt text is because it would have it serve you in your life. So it's our privilege as people who see to not even have to know what it is because it doesn't affect our lives. So that is the point of this question is both to tell you about it so that maybe you can take this knowledge into your work and also to you know, shake it up a little bit. Yes, we don't have to even think about it because it's not part of the discrimination that or the inaccessibility that we face. Okay. So in sign language, the symbol for tree is the same in all languages. Is this true or false? Let you come in. Yep, let's go ahead with that. Um, quite recently, I went to this really great anti-racism seminar in, in Romania, uh, where Lydia, who was a speaker during this uh, past, uh, during this session of uh, anti-racism uh, uh, presentations here at Salto uh, this winter, uh, who was, uh, she's an amazing speaker. I, I highly recommend that uh, you follow her on Instagram. Uh, she was one of the participants in the seminar and there were two of them that were uh, deaf. And uh, this was the first time I had to, um, I, I participated somewhere where there were deaf participants. And it was such a learning curve for me because I, uh, like many people just thought that sign language was universal, but it isn't. And uh, so all sign languages have their own symbols. Um, sign languages can have var varieties and accents and uh, different regional var variants. Um, but for example, just so you know, if I'm not mistaken, tree is, I don't think I'm doing it right. Tree is like this in English sign language, but in Japanese sign language it is, and I hope somebody could correct me if I'm doing it wrong, but because the trees are different in Japan, than they are in, uh, in well, wherever the English sign language was constructed, uh, the sign is not the same. So this is a variety of languages that we don't know about if we are not exposed to the reality of deaf, uh, the deaf community. And I think it's very important for us to keep it in mind that we over, often oversimplify uh, things that we do not know. And so, yeah, sign language, uh, the symbol for tree is not, the same in all languages and uh, sign languages are very different uh, between each other because they are languages like all of our languages and for the next exercise how often per day do you reflect on accessibility now let's just be completely honest and how often do you think about it um, sometimes yeah rarely completely normal to think about it quite rarely, especially if it's not affecting you in your life. Uh, but keep in mind that if your life is affected by accessibility, you do not have a choice. You have to think about it all the time. To be completely honest, I wasn't reflecting about accessibility much in my life. I never went into a restaurant and thought, huh, there's only stairs here. Like how could a person in a wheelchair come in here? Until my brother um, had an illness and is now using a wheelchair. So now I think about it uh, most of the time, wherever I go, I, I have this reflection, well, my brother wouldn't be able to come in here because there's no way for him to access this space. But before that I wasn't exposed to it. So I never really thought about it. So it's very important for all of us who are not affected uh, by lack of accessibility to still keep it in mind so that we are not organizing events in inaccessible spaces. Uh, and it's a privilege that we have to not even have to think about it or thinking about it rarely. So I am very happy that there are people that are thinking about it. So I encourage you to keep it behind your ear, like we say in Icelandic, uh, all the time as much as you can in all of you, especially in youth work. And it's also, even though there's not a person participating that needs accessibility, it's also just to encourage the young people around us to think about it themselves. So I think it's always a good, uh, good way of thinking about um, accessibility um, to be inclusive. Yeah. So one of the 
later questions before we get to the end here is race is your race a big part of your self identity uh, yes and there are no right or wrong answers here it's just curious to see um, for a lot of people of color uh, it is a big part of their self identities because there is some history connected to it um, often it is something that uh, has to do with their lived experiences and uh, it's just mo molded who they are as a person and this is of course true for many people from many countries uh, no matter what the race is uh, but I, I just want to point out that often um, when race isn't a part of the self-identity, that it hasn't become something that affects you to the point where it becomes a def defining factor for your life. It is often because you have not been uh, racially, um, you know, pinpointed or profiled or, you know, told who you are because of your race, or you have no lived experiences or you have lesser lived experiences because of your race per se. So, of course, there's nothing right or wrong in this uh, race can be as big part of your identity um, as any other thing, or it's not. But uh, that's why I think we should not be stop. We should not stop talking about races and our whatever it is, even though we know that there is no biological difference between human beings based on their race. But for those that need to speak about their um, from the point of view of the of being a black woman or being a person of color, um, it's not helpful to tell them, oh, we don't see race or we don't talk about race. So uh, that's the point of this question. And then there's this one. Do you feel like your personal ideal family structure is accepted by society? Whatever that means in your context. And I think uh, this is something that, uh, we should keep in mind those of you who say yes to this question is that the added strain of not having this uh, freedom of feeling like your ideal family structure would be accepted by society is an added strain that we uh, who do not fall into that category who would say um, yes to this question um, uh, it's a privilege to not even have to think about, and it can be uh, an added strain and an emotional toil for people who are feeling like the way that they would choose their lives uh, is excluded by the, the way society is run. Uh, so yes, I think uh, it's, this is, it's very interesting to see these results, and I always I look at them, and I just hope that for you that it creates some sort of reflection. Uh, I think there might be one more question before we get back to, yeah, this is the last one. Again, to the race. Uh, how often do you think about your race every day? And this is the last one. Um, all the time, never, rarely, sometimes. Yeah, I I think it's very, very important to have uh, this discussion. Um, I personally think about it a lot, um, but maybe not all the time, but it really depends on where I am. When I'm in Iceland, I think about kind of all the time, but when I'm traveling, not as much, um, because I kind of get um, this, I'm ambiguous when I'm in many countries, but here I, I, I feel it on my skin so much that I, I don't fit into the, the type of like what people see as being Icelandic and I get reminded of it so often that I am constantly thinking about how I walk how I'm feeling when I walk into a space I'm aware of the fact that I have a browner skin than the most of the Icelandic people around me so it is sort of a privilege to not have to think about your race every day ever at all because that usually means that we are in sort of a majority and and we're not being reminded about the fact that we stick out um, I don't know if this is the case here but I think it's important to know that uh, for people of color it's usually not a choice that they are thinking about their race all the time or often it is because it's inflicted on them to have to think about it Anyway, so 
back to the answers from earlier. So I want you to look at these different factors that comprise your life or who you are. And I want you to try to imagine a time in history where some part of you would not have been accepted or is still not being accepted by society. And just think about how it makes you feel. Reflect on like, would it be your fault if this particular part was not accepted? Or you, when I say accepted, I say either you would face discrimination, you would not have job, you would not be awarded the same opportunities, or people would simply just treat you in a, in a negative way. And how you would feel if the opportunities, opportunities you've had in your life so far would not have been open to you just because of this fact, uh, factor of your life that is something that you probably did not choose to be, but you are. Um, and this is something that I, I just want to influence you to think about, um, because often like the feeling that we get when we think about this thing, it, it's, it's, it's rough, it's hard, like it's, it's, it's a bad feeling. You don't want to feel excluded because of something you cannot change. And uh, this is something that people who face racism are experiencing a lot. Uh, they cannot change the skin they were born in, and they are still facing obstacles. And, the, and if we can start understanding a little bit the feeling of what it causes, then we might be better at taking the step forward and creating a more inclusive environment uh, for, for all uh, of the young people that we're working with. But anyway, uh, now I finished this exercise with you and I'm really thankful that so many of you participated in it and I hope it uh, made you reflect on, on your situation and, and uh, how your situation might be different from other people. Um, but just to end this briefly, uh, going over uh, how to practice anti-racism because it's first and foremost individual work. You've already taken the step to come here today and I'm really, really thankful for it. I am of course an anti-racism educator so I enjoy speaking about this subject, but we too often of also place the main responsibility uh, of uh, speaking of the subject on those who are subject to racism. So we ask the young people who are subject to racism to explain to us why things are not okay and why they you know what their experience is uh, when we could just as well educate ourselves um, um, and the challenge is, is getting people who are not uh, affected by it to actively inform themselves this is what I I've struggled with a lot people come to the presentation and they really agree with everything I'm saying I see them nod and and they want to they want to do better, but then they go home and then there's there is no more effort and it's a reluctancy or it's just I don't know if it's just hesitation or everybody just doesn't have enough time. So my suggestion uh, is to actively seek out ways to listen to people to listen to people's experiences like on interviews uh, or the ones that you're working with and take a time see how you feel when people talk about unfair treatment and you know because it can make us upset or angry to hear that something was said in our immediate environment that hurt someone else or was done that hurt someone else um, but we have to make sure also that we are not letting out the anger towards the person who was the victim of it and we need to allow them a space for their feelings because otherwise we might create space where they are afraid to talk about their experiences so First, listen and then watch. Um, you can actively look for different kinds of social media content from the one that you are watching all the time. For example, following hashtag topics like hashtag racism so that you get posts on the subject into your feed of what you are normally watching uh, in everyday life. Um, look specifically for films on the subject, but also just from films, regular films from other cultures, not films that are created um, by countries outside of the cultures, about the cultures, but films literally from the cultures that uh, you might be working with a group of young people from those countries. Uh, why not uh, broadening your horizon from 
uh, diff from their perspective. Sometimes it's nice to bring those uh, cultural elements into the everyday life. And I say this to the young Icelandic youth workers, not only during some sort of thematic weeks where we are um, embracing diversity, but just in an everyday regular setting. And you can either read or listen to audiobooks on the subject. There's a lot of them, podcasts as well. And there are plenty of authors that have written on the subject and uh, there are books and articles specifically on racism that you can you can educate yourself and take in uh, take a little bit of the workload of the shoulders of the people who are around you that might be subject to racism. So because in the end, um, the existence of Existence of racism is not your fault personally. You didn't create it. However, you have the personal responsibility to actively fight it. Otherwise, you're supporting its continuation, uh, continuated effect on our societies and our lives. So I think this is a good way to end this because we're running out of time. And uh, I hope this has been useful to you. And I'm very happy to take up any questions. Uh, or uh, have a chat with you here uh, before we end this session. Miriam, thank you so, so much. I think it has been amazing to follow and very well structured and also really participatory, something that practicing racism is very different from the rest of our ID talks because we did want to practice anti-racism or to practice um, getting the feeling of your workshops. I can go ahead with my question and then the rest of participants can come um, in with their questions. You don't have to type them. You can also raise a hand on, on these reactions and uh, ask your questions directly. Um, so I live in a seemingly mono-ethnic, mono-racial, mono-religious context like Iceland some years ago. We still haven't reached this 25% um, uh, migrant rate, and we actually are something like 97% Armenian, Apostolic, Christian here. But still, I find it's very important to educate young people about diversity, racial diversity, and anti-racism, because it's very easy to say you are not racist when you never encountered people, so people of other races. So what would you suggest to a youth worker that works in this context, that it's maybe not uh, addressing an, an, an issue that is in the society already, this racism, but to prevent uh, the society from being racist towards people that are coming in? I know this could be a separate ID talk um, topic, but maybe uh, like one or two tips that we can as youth workers practice. Uh, thank you for this very uh, difficult question. Um, and thank you, I see Claudia, thank you for the message. Uh, bye bye. Um, uh, thank you for your comment on the, on the presentation. But to get back to your question, Anna, um, this is a thing that I faced in Iceland a lot uh, because it was also such a uh, homogeneous society for such a long time. Uh, I'm still hearing people say, but there is no racism in Iceland, you know, because how can we be racist when there are no people of color, which is, of course, not true anymore, because there are definitely people of color in Iceland. And just so you know, the, the majority of the 25% of the immigrant population uh, or the people with foreign backgrounds uh, are not necessarily people of color either. Um, I think... For example, one exercise you can do with young people in the context of like, for example, a country like Armenia is, uh, you know, discussing what is it that makes you Armenian, you know, and usually people kind of, they can, you can list some things. Um, I don't know, I'll just give an example like I did with Iceland, there's this like, all these elements that you know you love your city or you love the place you grew up you love this kind of food and then kind of asking them to reflect you know but what if the person ticks all of these boxes but they're black because there's a black person that is going to grow up in armenia at some point and relate to all of these things um, and why and why would that be something for them to say that they are not Armenian and take that discussion on what it what is it that means to be from here and why do we 
connected with a race automatically. And, uh, you know, take a look at also, I guess, um, countries that often people look up to, um, or, you know, like, I don't know, a lot of people go to Canada, for example, and move to Canada and everybody is very impressed by the Canadian diversity. And we can see that as a thing that we approve of. It is a reality over there. Why can it not be a reality over here? And what does it mean? And then there is also the exercise of opposites. What would you feel like if you moved to a country and you felt like you belonged to it? And how would you feel if somebody told you that you didn't? But, you know, not denying them their Armenian roots, but um, also if they start sensing a belonging somewhere else, how do they feel about being denied of that? And, uh, and putting that in the context of another person and adding the race, racial factor in and just having that discussion. And I think it's also, of course, important to talk to young people about the origins of racism and that it's not only uh, like um, a recent thing that racism has had its layered effect through our colonizational history. So uh, to know why it is affecting our societies and why we see, see it still today. Thank you very much. We had, uh, yeah, well, this is a question we could go on discussing forever, but I think uh, what I hear from your answer is that there is still so many ways we need to talk about racism and we need to practice anti-racism, even if we have this feeling that this is something that has nothing to do with us or mm -hmm. something that has in no way affect, affects our um, society. But we are all living in this one big global society where actually uh, yeah this actually this education matters to everybody thank mm -hmm. you very much we had a hand from somebody whose screen name is 77777 and uh, you have now um, turned on your camera so it's really good to know there is a person behind <laughs> the screen and not not, not uh, artificial intelligence so if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question or give your comment please yeah, of course. Hello, everyone. I'm Mylinda. Sorry that I didn't have charge on my phone, so I, I needed to use my, my friend's phone. And of course, here I'm talking for Albania, and here is 30 degrees already, so I'm taking some sun. We are lucky people in some way. Lucky you, and yes. In fact, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And in fact, I wanted to, to give a comment about your questions, but then I turn, you know, <laughs> I turn back the, the hand because I, I understood that the, the question was toward Miriam. But anyway, we can, I can describe a little bit the situation here in Albania. Uh, you know, being in, uh, in 50 years in communism, we didn't have much contact with other people. So we are being just Albanians here. And in 19th, a part that uh, has, has been a discrimination or racism against Albanians abroad, happened here in Albania and even now we are really open society here but still Albanians don't accept that you'll be married with you know like a, a black man black woman they would prefer always to be Albanian so to be their nationality even as I said we are more open because they immigrated everywhere now in 13 years and things have changed but what will uh, give really and will have a good impact on this will be the fact to be more open. So until the moment we, uh, we had the, the visa, we had the chance to go in Europe with the Schengen visa and things hopefully and uh, change really, really in a good way. But before we didn't have the chance. And if you don't have the access to other cultures, always you'll have this, uh, this gap, this problematic uh, think uh, between different nationalities but at the moment you you meet different people different cultures travel then prejudices like disappear mm -hmm. I think that happened to me even when I start when I, I came a little bit late here and I was listening about white you know like white discrimination right white racism so when I was in New York, I used to have the racism towards me because I was white and it was really something strange for me. 
when I was in Metro, but I don't want to take time to show this uh, probably in uh, another moment we talk. But uh, about your question, I think that the only good thing and the best way is just to uh, to create different uh, group of young people, to make exchanges, to go to travel, different programs is the only way that to uh, to step up the different kind of racism. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for your comment. Um, Miriam, do you want to add something to this? And to our participants, we know that uh, our initial time is up and you are leaving some, some of you. We will finish uh, soon. But if you still have a question, I think we can take one more. So please either write in the chat or, or raise a hand and we will take one more question. Miriam, would you like to react to the previous comment? Well, I, I just, I, I want to, uh, I mean, stress on the same topic as Melinda said that, of course, uh, traveling uh, is a way to open up people's minds and their perspectives. And this is why I think the Erasmus program is a huge blessing that we can actually use it to either bring young people out of their comfort zone or bring uh, other young people to them so they can meet and interact. Because when it becomes a fun setting, uh, it's easier to talk about these these things, and uh, of course, uh, I wasn't. I was speaking on. I think when you came in, you might have come in when I was speaking on on uh, white privilege, which is more, um, you know, being not, uh, you know, being in the the situation where you are not subject to um, a racial, like negative racial. Uh, effects of society because based on your race, even though you might have other uh, negative experiences in your life, but they're usually not because of your race. And that is the, the definition of, of white privilege. And of course, there's discrimination happens in different societies on different levels uh, and towards people in different contexts. And, uh, and I think like what, when I have spoken to young people in Iceland who have traveled and the, there have been people who have you know, mentioned how they traveled to countries where they were in a mi minority. Um, and when you know they were blonde and blue eyed in a setting where everybody else looked different and everybody was always touching them and you know playing with their hair and it became really annoying there was this one girl i remember told me like this is the first time she really under understood the annoyance of you know people always wanting to touch uh, afro hair for example in white societies and and not uh, respecting the personal space uh, of the person with uh, with the hair and this is like something that continuously happens but we also have to take into account that the situation is also in a way different for this person that uh, Icelandic person who went abroad she was still in a position of privilege in, in terms of the respect that she got there as a white person and uh, versus a person in, with a afro hair in a white society where is constantly being told to straighten the hair and there's like historical elements related to the hair care and you know the hair being considered unnatural or uh, lesser uh, that is of course not the same in the experiences but at least by traveling this young person was able to realize that oh yeah this kind of you know this is if if this is annoying for me how must it be for somebody else and to be able to put yourself in other shoes and getting to know other cultures of course is eye-opening and, and a good good way to to uh, break down these barriers for sure so thank thanks to my linda for her uh, input we have also a few really interesting and very kind of positive comments from uh, Ra uh, ramona Mm -hmm. uh, who is on the bus with 23 other people and cannot open her camera but still participate through the comments um what would you say to this and maybe we start wrapping uh, up today's session 
Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with this. And this is why when I started doing anti-racism um, workshops and the teachers were always like, well, yeah, you can go and talk to the kids and we'll go have some coffee while you do that. And it's not important, like, like it wouldn't be important that they l listen to the presentation. Like, I'm not going to fix anything speaking about racism to kids who probably know more about racism than the actual teachers because they are following the topic more actively on social media. Um, so I think it's very important that we start early, uh, but we also start with the educators uh, as well. So I'm very happy that all of you are here, but we also need to address uh, the other people around us that are working with young people um, so that we can educate them. Um, because if you're educating them on anti-racism, but once they go home from school, there is an adult that is completely breaking down everything we've said. Who are they probably going to trust more with the information they get? It's usually the parent. So uh, in society, I think it's very important that we are taking anti-racism to a level of uh, you know, information access to, to all people. But yes, you're right, children are not born racist. They don't usually realize it until they don't they don't start behaving in any exclusive way until they've gotten the ideas that they should from usually adults in their life or media. Thank you very much, Miriam. We are not saying by not closing the day just yet, because we have come to this moment in our program, which I forgot to announce in the beginning. But throughout the whole session, our amazing uh, graphic facilitator, graphic recorder, Olaja, has been taking visual notes of the presentation of our conversation. And I would like to now pass you the floor, Olaja, to share your work. Thank you very much, Anna. I hope you can hear me now. And you should be seeing my recording in a few seconds. It usually takes yes. a moment. Perfect. So yeah, it was uh, very nice listening to, to Miriam because it was very enjoyable how it was structured, as you said as well. It was a very good balance, let's say, between the personal experiences, this um, uh, negative impact or reflections that, that motivated right Miriam to follow the path that she followed. And then also merging it with very important definitions, uh, very important concepts to get to know if we were not familiar with them before or to go deeper into. And then also with the practical bit of some self uh, reflection or self assessment of what we know or what we don't know, and perhaps we should also start thinking more about or being more conscious about. So definitely some food for thought and it was very, very uh, enjoyable for me to be here behind the screen listening and and getting into all the the input thank you Miriam thank you Olaja for the visuals thank you and um, also to let you know everybody um uh, after the ID talk within uh, approximately two weeks you will get uh, this recording uh, the final version of Olaja's graphic recording uh, as well as uh, the article from Miriam, the video on YouTube of today's session, a podcast based on today's audio, all to your mailbox uh, from Salto Inclusion and Diversity team. And I would like to now pass Miriam the floor to say a few words um, before um, then passing it to Peter Jan for some closing remarks and announcements. Please, Miriam. If you would like to say something about today's experience or maybe some wishes and uh, final like wisdom. I think I've already spoken a lot. Uh, I'm just very happy to see so many people showing up, even though we had technical difficulties there in the beginning. I'm, I'm just honored to have the platform and it is a privilege for me to be able to come and speak here and I am really aware of it. And I, I hope that you can all take it into your lives, uh, thinking about where you have privilege and where you have power to do good and, and change things so that uh, we can all have a better, better society. Uh, because I think it uh, ultimately benefits all of us. Uh, inactive citizens are unhappy citizens, and usually that creates more problems than it solves. So it is better for us that everyone has equal opportunities. Uh, so thank you, and I will, I guess, give the floor to Peter Jan then. Yes, Peter Jan, uh, since today is the last uh, session of this autumn, of uh, this edition 
series of ID Talks. I would like to ask you to, to close it on behalf of Salto Inclusion and Diversity. And if there is anything that you would like to take us, take with us for the winter, please, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to close this uh, autumn series of ID Talks. Uh, however, it feels a bit strange as I wasn't really involved in the process. Uh, it's mainly my colleague Maria who is organizing the ID Talks and, and today was the first without her and uh, it looks like we really need her as we were already facing some uh, technical issues. Uh, so sorry for that. Um, but yeah, in any case, um, thanks for joining uh, this ID Talk and um, connected to, to what Anna asked me, but uh, more in particular, I would like to thank you for engaging with the, the topic of anti-racism. And we hope that the ID Talk series on anti-racism enriched you, uh, made you reflect and connected to what Miriam uh, talked about or said, um, that it empowered you to, to act and uh, actively fight racism. Um, and yeah, to close this series, uh, I'd also like to thank the speakers that were involved uh, in the ID Talks and of course the speaker of today, Miriam. Um, it was really interesting today to get this more practical, hands-on input uh, on anti-racism. Um, and as so many comments were made, I think it really gives a lot of food for thought. Um, and lastly, of course, I also want to, to thank the ID Talks team. So Anna, uh, Maria, Olaja, uh, thanks for all your hard work. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you. We're really privileged in this sense. Um, and uh, to conclude, um, I'd like to share some good news. Uh, we'll be back, or the ID Talks will be back in spring. So uh, from February to April, uh, we'll dive into the topic of mental health. Um, and with the help of technology, fingers crossed, uh, we'll keep you posted. So uh, stay tuned. So thanks again. See you soon. Uh, back to you, Anna. Yes, we are not saying goodbye, but we are saying see you soon. We will see you again next spring in the sixth um, season of the ID Talks. Really excited about it. And now, yeah, have a, have a great end of your day. And because we will not meet each other till the end of the year, have a better 2023 than a 2022. I think I was the first one to congratulate you on the new year this time. So bye-bye.